Okay, well, thank you all for coming. Um, we are honored to have Dr. Peter Navarro come today for a very specific uh, discussion of the report he and his office released uh, last week. Uh, we have to be in our best behavior because we're streaming live on the internet. Uh, I would ask all of you as a courtesy to Dr. Navarro at the end of his comments uh, at one o'clock, we all just stay in our seats uh, let him go out the back door, hopefully with a big round of applause. Um, the, I'm going to applaud him. I've read the report and the appendix. In fact, I took it with me to China last week to try to get reactions from the Chinese. They, they for the first year and a half of the Trump administration, they tried to pretend Dr. Navarro uh, did not exist. And that has changed. Uh, since this report came out, and also since the Wall Street Journal has written so much about him, and the president has praised him, uh, the Chinese now have a, a totally different approach. That Dr. Navarro exists, but he should be struggled against. Uh, and this report has gone unacknowledged, unreported in the Chinese media. This, to me, is a home run for Dr. Navarro and the report. It means that what he's describing in this report is so sensitive and accurate that the Chinese media doesn't have a response yet. And in my personal view, this report suggests one of the steps to avoid a trade war or, and to return to the idea of cooperation with China is that China somehow has to deal with the hard evidence Dr. Navarro puts in this report. Now, he very carefully cites other U.S. government documents. He cites a Defense Department study that came out in January of this year that goes over many techniques of concern to the Defense Department in China's industrial power. He cites uh, academic research. He cites newspaper stories. And the report also seems to have, in my personal opinion as a scholar in this field, it seems to have quite a bit of new information probably from the U.S. intelligence community that has not been declassified before. So I thought the report was quite important, a, a new state-of-the-art finding. But it goes back to something that the Obama administration uh, issued in January of 2017. The Obama administration issued a White House study uh, of... Chinese industrial policy as it focused on the semiconductor industry. And many of the same issues of <clears throat> intellectual property theft, use of investment, use of companies, coercion of firms, they were first raised in the Obama report, but the, it too didn't get much press attention because it was already January 2017. So I think Dr. Navarro's plan today is to go over the contents of the report that is unknown to the Chinese people. So if we have uh, media reach into China, uh, it will continue the notion that China really owes an answer to these uh, concerns that have been so carefully documented uh, in this report. And by the way, it has an annex. This report has not only 160 footnotes, the annex has even more and has a very detailed account of these Chinese industrial uh, policies. Frankly, the term economic aggression in the title uh, policies. Frankly, the term economic aggression in the title, I personally believe this is quite justified. Once you read the whole report, you will see that economic aggression is correct, and it's not introduced here for the first time. It was in President Trump's national security strategy uh, when that was issued. So... I hope you all will join me in a warm round of applause for Dr. Peter Navarro. Uh, <clears throat> and I should say that the sales of his three books have gone up. Uh, and a really wonderful development is his film, which is on YouTube online. In the next day or two, it's going to reach one million viewers. The title is somewhat controversial. It's called Death by China. Dr. Peter Navarro. Yeah. <laughs>
The mastery of the understatement somewhat controversial. Uh, <clears throat> my, uh, my deep thanks to Hudson Institute for sp uh, sponsoring this. And uh, actually, two of my favorite scholars are, are here. Uh, one of them is uh, Mr. Pillsbury. Um, uh, also, Seth Cropsey, who has been really at the forefront of trying to get this uh, Navy in uh, the United States uh, back on track. The president himself is committed to a 351 ship Navy. It's, and it's only through the analyses of people like Seth uh, that we have situational awareness about why we need to do that. So I congratulate Hudson for being at the forefront. My mission today is, is simple. Uh, the, um, let me quote Deng Xiaoping to start this off, seek truth from facts. And all I'm going to do today is provide a, a factual account of the industrial policies Act policies and practices of the People's Republic of China, which are presented in this matrix. It's, uh, we have six strategies of what Mr. Pillsbury called economic aggression. That's not my term. It is a term that was introduced um, in the 2017 National Security Strategy. Uh, and then on, on the, uh, the column here is the over 50 acts, policies, and practices that China engages in, um, in order to promote its economy worldwide. And if you can say that one picture is worth a thousand words, this matrix is worth about a half a trillion dollars a year that contributes to the trade surplus of China using these various acts, policies, and practices, most of which are outside the bounds of the international trading order. But before I do that, let me, let me just step back for a minute and talk a little bit about the administration's um, trade policy and trade philosophy. The president, President Donald J. Trump, has made it clear uh, that he's a free trader. He has made it abundantly clear that for this administration, free trade means trade that is free, fair, reciprocal, and balanced free, fair, reciprocal, and balanced. And um, in a world where we had free, fair, reciprocal, and balanced trade, we would have zero tariffs. We would have zero non-tariff barriers. We would have zero subsidies to industry. We would have zero incidences of currency manipulation and currency undervaluation. And we would have zero in, uh, instances of using the value-added tax, not as a way to raise revenue in a given country, but also as a tool of mercantilism to keep goods out of that country and provide competitive advantage. If we were in China, you might call that the five zeros. Um, we're not in that world. And because we're not in that world, every year, the United States of America uh, basically sends about a half a trillion dollars a year offshore in the form of a trade deficit. This is something that's not supposed to happen in the Ricardian trade model. Let me say that again. This is not what is supposed to happen in the Ricardian trade model, which, which my colleagues in economics and Folks in the media and everybody in between love to cite as the, as the free trade model. Gains from trade, everybody wins. In the Ricardian trade model, you, you can never have these persistent deficits because of things like currency adjustments, right? But we have these, we're shipping off a half a trillion dollars a year. We are, as President Trump has said, the piggy bank of the world. And the reason why this happens is because countries around the world do not engage in free, fair, reciprocal, and balanced trade. Uh, we have, for example, uh, a trade deficit with China, which accounts for about half of the problem. But at the same time, the European Union is about $151 billion in 2017 in trade deficit in goods. Um, that's about 20% of the problem. And then you have Japan and Mexico with about another 18% of the problem. And if you look at these different countries, um, they all manage to gain 
advantage over this kind. I don't call it competitive advantage. I just simply say advantage over this country in different ways. Germany, for example, which sells us three cars for every one we sell to them, has a tariff on autos which is four times higher than ours. Japan, which has very low tariffs, sells us over 100 cars for every one we sell them. Extraordinary. And the problem there is non-tariff barriers. So all the president is trying to do with his trade policy, all he's trying to do is level the playing field. And we would love to live in a world where the rest of the world caught up to this. I don't know if you know this, but the United States of America has among the lowest tariff and non-tariff barriers in the world. Last thing I should tell you is about the World Trade Organization, which is very, very interesting. You might think that the World Trade Organization was an organization where it led to a lowering of tariffs for everybody. But the problem is they have this thing called MFN, Most Favored Nation Rule, which basically says that any given country has to charge the lowest tariffs in the, in, to any one country that they charge to everybody else. Right? Let me say that again. The tariff they're going to set, if they, the lowest they give to one country, they have to charge to everybody else. So if we set 2.5% tariffs on autos, that's what we set to everybody. But if China sets 25% to everybody, they can get away with that. The European Union get a, can get away with 10%. So that's the global trading order that, that, that the, this president and this administration wants to, to move towards the more ideal world of free, fair, balanced, and reciprocal trade. Now, let's get to the matter at hand. Uh, this uh, report by the Office of Trade and Manufacturing Policy uh, was, was months in the making. It was an interagency effort where the report out went out to numerous agencies in the intelligence community. It was reviewed very carefully. It's, I think it's well documented. I, would, I won't challenge you, but, but please look through the footnotes and tell me if you find anything that doesn't ring true. Um, the foundation of this report is good analysis by a lot of people. I would say the DIUX report that the Pentagon put out is very, very good in the technology space. There's reports by the European and American Chambers of Commerce, which detail chapter and verse all of the unfair trade practices European and American businesses encounter when trying to get into the Chinese market. Um, so there is that. Uh, there is the United States Trade Representative 301 investigation report that came about as a result of the Section 301, which is um, it's an extraordinary sleeping pill, okay, because it's, it's so dense, but it's also so good. I mean, if you're going to be an expert in this, you need to read that chapter and verse. But it's not just the, these documents. It's also um, what the Chinese government tells us. If you read, for example, two documents, the medium to long range planning document in 2006, it pretty much lays out much of these industrial policies that are used uh, to promote the Chinese economy. Uh, and then, of course, there's the, um, the now banned in China, apparently. They banned their own policy, uh, China, uh, made in China 2025. This is extraordinary. This is a policy which uh, came out with great fanfare. It's referenced repeatedly in different do government documents, as you can find in the USTR. And now there are reports out in the press that the Chinese themselves are suppressing that as a way of not letting you know that the intent of that report um, is to put forward a set of plans that would capture 70% of the production of the emerging industries of the future within seven years. Extraordinary. And as President Trump has said, if we lose the industries of the future, we won't have a future. So um, some of you at least have the uh, chart as a handout. And, and it's, it's, it'll be up, up on the web available to you. But let me just now walk through what the chart looks like. It's, it's a standard matrix where you have 
these six categories of economic aggression. And this is the industrial policy of China. And what, what distinguishes China from the rest of the world, most of the rest of the world, is that it's a non-market economy. It's a heavily state-directed, state-driven economy. And so in the first, first uh, in the second column here, uh, one goal is to protect the Chinese market uh, from competition and imports. No, no secret there. The second goal is to expand the global share of markets, that is to attack global markets. This would be in the vernacular protectionist. This would be mercantilist. China also for decades has had a policy of going out and trying to secure the core resources of the world. Uh, it, it can be things like uh, copper in Chile. It can be things like cobalt, which is really important uh, in high-tech production in the Congo. Uh, and they've done a very, very good job um, of doing that. Um, the third, uh, the fourth category, dominate traditional manufacturing industries. Uh, they've, they've done a superb job of doing that. Um, air conditioning, appliances, machine tools, shoes, computers, electronics. They have well over 50% market share in most of the traditional manufacturing industries. They have become the factory floor of the world. This, this, this didn't happen by accident. It didn't happen through free market capitalism. It happened through these set of practices, which I'm going to talk about shortly. And then these last two columns here capture, in essence, the problem that the United States trade representative has been grappling with uh, in terms of the attacks on our technological base uh, by the People's Republic of China. Um, this is simply acquiring the technologies and intellectual property from not just the United States, but from the rest of the world. Uh, and at the same time, capture the emerging high-tech uh, industries that will drive future growth and advancements in the defense industry. And uh, what's important What's important about this last column here, this is, this is the made in China 2025 industries plus the industries identified in medium to long range planning 2006 document. It's things like autonomous vehicles, robotics, high tech shipping, advanced manufacturing. There's things I call extreme manufacturing, which is the nano technology at one end, but also large facilities bigger than anything you could see or imagine. Uh, China is trying to dominate all of this. Now, how do they go about it? And this is where we get to, uh, to the 50 different ways. This, there's over 50 different things here. And if you look at the chart, you can't see it from where you're sitting, but there's a little Y for yes in each one of the cells. So, for example, there's some things that China does which is only used to advance one goal. For example, there's a, there's a technique they use called brand forcing or the forced use of Chinese brands. Um, this is when a, a company, a foreign company with a well-known brand comes in with a quality product, sets up their facilities in China and wants to sell into the market, but it's, it's forbidden from using its own brand. You put a Chinese brand on it, and then that is used in the domestic market. And then that down the road, the hope is that they'll build that brand and begin using that internationally. So that would be one where it's simply in one cell. On the other hand, there are some things on the chart which, which run the table, all six strategies. Uh, one of them, for example, is consolidating state-owned enterprises into national champions consolidating state-owned enterprises into national champions. This is really, really important uh, to understand. Um, if, for example, you look at um, the rolling stock industry, uh, this is, this is the, 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 the trains and the metro cars and things like that. A um, lot of jobs, a lot of technology, a lot of implications for the future. Um, in the beginning in China, they had a number of national champions that they were breeding within the country to um, produce first in China and then sally forth around the world. 
Um, as they proceeded in that industry and others, they've realized that the best thing to do is to consolidate those industries, basically create monopolies within the country to go out and do battle with uh, the rest of the world. And in that particular industry, rolling stock, they basically put Australia out of business in that. Uh, the, the company CRRC, I believe it's, it's the name, uh, is making a, a very strong bid in this country. And the problem that you have is that these, these, uh, these national champions, when they sally forth, benefit from a lot of the things that are on the rest of the matrix here. So let me, again, uh, Deng Xiaoping, seek truth from facts. Let me just walk you through some of the things they do on this chart. So it's literally, I didn't quite find a Z on this, but I got down to W. Um, and you start with the adverse administrative approvals and licensing processes. We have approvals and licensing processes for any foreign company or domestic company that wants to produce in this market, sell into this market, and that's fine. But the problem is, and there's well over a dozen or more of these, these approvals processes, the Chinese will use uh, the ability to gain your license or your administrative approval as a tool to extract some kind of concessions, usually on technology. And so this is a, this is a very powerful tool. It's very difficult to detect essentially um, as an unfair trade practice, but it's systemic in, uh, in the Chinese economy when you try to try and you go in there. Um, second one on the list is, is anti-monopoly law extortion. I think the poster child for this is what happened with Qualcomm. Uh, basically, uh, this, this law was invoked uh, against Qualcomm and the, there was an extraction of a very large sum of money, but also some promises, again, of technology transfer. It's always about technology transfer. And the, what, the, what came out of the 301 investigation was an understanding of when China goes after our technology and our intellectual property, they steal it, they force the transfer of it, they evade the export controls that we have in place, and they buy it. And when you're running a third of a trillion dollars deficit with China every year, they accumulate a lot of money to buy it. Um, burdensome and intrusive testing. This is an interesting uh, tool. So you have a medical device or a car or, or some kind of product uh, that what you want to sell into the Chinese market. So what, is the, what do the Chinese say? Well, um, we need to unpack this thing. What's, 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 what's in it? So then you, 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 they get to look kind of behind the veil. And it's like, well, we're just doing it to make sure that no, there's no health and safety problems. But again, it's a way of extracting information and technology. And it can be burdensome as well. You can withhold or delay the testing unless you get a concession. This is in effect. And by the way, one of the, one of the things my office does at the White House, we have what we call a SWAT team, where companies come to us with specific problems. Uh, and I've had many, many companies come in with a problem that they're having with China, and they'll go, oh man, they did this to us. And then they did this to us, and then they did to us this. And I bring them over to the chart, and you see, you mean they did that, that, and that. A and they go, oh, we're not the only one. See, that's the thing. We're not the only one. It's like, this is why I think this report could be useful because it, it gives everybody a common understanding of the challenges that we need to face, of the structural challenges. Um, Chinese Communist Party co-ops corporate governance. Um, this is truly extraordinary. Uh, we have now... By decree, the Chinese uh, Communist Party getting seats on governing boards of companies. So, so this is not profit maximization anymore. This is more like advance the strategic goals of the state. Um, claim sovereign immunity on U.S. soil to prevent litigation. This is kind of interesting. They want access to our market. 
and to do business here, but they also want to claim their state-owned enterprises and they're not subject to our laws. Interesting. Um, counterfeiting and piracy, the um, intellectual pride, the IP commission report that John Huntsman led, Rich Elling spent a lot of work on, came out with um, costs in the order of, of $300 billion a year just on theft alone. I mean, this is like an extraordinary transfer of wealth. Um, cyber-enabled espionage and theft, data localization mandates, which allow them to peek under the hood, debt trap financing to developing countries. This speaks to uh, the idea that the way China is able, in many cases, to gain control not just of the resources of a country like copper um, or um, cobalt, but also of infrastructure, um, is to lend a bunch of money to these countries that they really can't afford to borrow and then foreclose on that loan, just like happened. Anybody know the Hanban Tota issue, the Sri Lanka issue? I believe that's the one where they, the Chinese basically gained ownership of that port. I mean, what's going on here? So um, the point is that this is a long list. Over 50 ways that China engages in these acts, policies, and practices with the goal of advancing uh, their own economic dominance, which has in itself military implications. And this is what we're up against when we're basically trying to build an international trading order based on free, fair, balanced, and reciprocal trade. So this is, I simply present to you this as facts, Challenge these as facts, if you will. I welcome, welcome that challenge. But if this matrix accurately describes the industrial policies, acts, and practices of the Chinese government, if that is true, then you can understand the structural challenge we face in trying to move to a better place down the road in terms of having a, a trading system it works for everybody because if you're in a negotiation, I'll leave you with this. If you're in a negotiation and you take 25 of these off the table in a successful negotiation, you still have 25 left. Thank you for uh, the audience here at the Hudson Institute. I salute uh, this institute and uh, I'm going to uh, get on with the mission leave? down the road here. Thank you, Thank sir. Thank you very much. All right. Come back. <laughs> Dr. Navarro, can we keep these charts? Yes, please. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming. Uh, I encourage everyone to download both the report and the annex uh, from the internet. There are a number of copies of the matrix sort of being passed around. I don't know of how many. Can you put your hand up if you've got a copy of it already? OK, so more dissemination is, is left. Uh, I, thank you for applauding. I think it's quite important that the think tank community uh, take Dr. Navarro's work seriously, not just his three books, but now his efforts with the White House. What I keep hearing is that there's much more of a team strategy at the White House. It's not sort of some sort of debate and, and factions going on. There's a combined approach. And as I said earlier when introducing Dr. Navarro, these concerns go back at least to the Obama administration. This, that may explain why two nights ago, um, 400 members of Congress voted to approve the reform of our so-called CFIA system, our protection against um, intellectual property and national security issues and investment coming into the country. Uh, 400 to 2. That's a pretty lopsided vote. In the Senate, the co-sponsor on the Democratic side was Dianne Feinstein. Obviously, Silicon Valley concerns. This also passed the Senate. So this is a really strongly bipartisan concern that many people have. And I think the publication of this report uh, provides a, a single document where the concerns are listed. Uh, 
And Dr. Navarro gave you a clue that just eliminating 25 of the report of the issues, 25 of the practices, wouldn't be enough. Ideally, all 50 will be dispensed with. And the European Union seems to have similar concerns. So thank you all very much for coming. The heads of team